right. So let me introduce the man himself. Uh, Courtier is the author of seven books, including uh, his much lauded debut, The Scholar, uh, a previous novel, The Gospel According to Cain, published in 2013, and uh, The Liverpool Time, which, if I remember rightly, was published earlier this year. Yeah, January. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he co-edited the Penguin Book of New Black Writing in Britain, and his short stories have featured in various anthologies and been broadcast on BBC Radio 4. He was shortlisted for the 2007 CWA Dagger in the Library Award, as a crime writing uh, award for those who are not familiar with them, and the 210 Alfred Fagan Award, uh, which is playwriting. Playwriting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> he was also awarded the, the Tony Barber's Award for Science Fiction Writing and the Roland Reese Bursary for Playwriting. As a screenwriter, he's written two episodes of Steve McQueen's 2020 BBC series, Smaller Acts. But tonight, at least for the first half of the session, uh, I'm going to be focusing our attention on A River Called Time. Uh, and I thought, uh, as this is a difficult book to attempt to describe in one brief paragraph, uh, we would give you something of the flavour and a taster of what is to come in the in its pages. Uh, if Courtier reads the timeline that appears at the beginning of the book. So, Courtier, yeah. take it away. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here and coming to see this uh, event. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, yeah, it'd be so great to see you guys in person, yeah, you, everyone in person, <laughs> but obviously we can't do that. So yeah, I'm still still lamenting that. Um, so yeah, I'm going to read this uh, this timeline uh, that appears in the beginning of the book. It's, I've never done this before, and, and Dave suggested this earlier today, and I thought, oh, that's that's really novel. You know, I've, I've, I've not done that. It's a it's a different kind of a reading. Uh, it's not that long, actually, so so yeah, it sh shouldn't take me too long. And just to kind of uh, give you a flavour of, of what's going on, uh, which I'll say more probably afterwards as so we So I'm talking. on, but I've got no sound. Ah, Jenny's having problems with sound. Fun. We can hear Jenny. Jenny can't hear us. Uh, so yeah, yeah, so, uh, so, so just to give you a flavour of it, um, uh, my my... This is set in an alternate world, and uh, this alternate world, uh, the Earth is called Geb. Uh, can everyone hear me? Is that, is that all right? Okay. Yeah, great. Yeah, this this uh, this this Earth is called Leave Geb. Leave it as <laughs> And uh, that's that's all all you need to know for now. And I'll try and get through this. Um, okay, so it's the Geb timeline. 5,900 BC, first Tasseti Kushite kings recorded. And Kush in ancient times was basically modern day. You made again, of course. 5,600, first Kemetian pharaoh recorded. And of course, uh, Kemet is the name for ancient Egypt as well. 2,500 BC. Foundation of Kerma, Tarseti, which is an ancient city in Sudan, one day Sudan. Um, Kerma was actually, like, it's, it's, they say it was the seat of, of um, the civilization with, which would then go on to become Egypt. So the, the originators of Egypt came from Sudan originally. There's about 230 uh, pyramids still standing in Sudan, small pyramids, you know, it's like it was like they're they were they were you know getting ready for the big pyramids so they were building but there's more pyramids in sudan actually than there are in egypt 2300 to 1500 bc origins of hinduism grow from the indus valley 1500 bc first tarseti pyramid 1600 bc first Kemetian pyramid 1000 emergence of abraham and the beginning of Judaism. 900 BC, King David forms Jewish empire in Israel and Lebanon. 463 to 383 BC, lifetime of Confucius. 304 BC, birth of Ahsoka Maria, Buddhist king. 3 BC to 27 AD, 
Lifetime of Jesus Christ. 50 AD, Buddhism introduced to China. 213 AD, Christianity tolerated in Roman Empire, emperors favoring religions based on committee and cosmology, or marked. 470 AD to 532 AD, Lifetime of Muhammad, founder of Islam. 553 AD, Quran written. 1245 AD, rise of Aztec civilization in Mexico. 1291 AD to 1375 AD, first Dalai Lama in Tibet. 1369 to 1439, lifetime of Guru Nanak, founder of Sikhism. 1392, Christopher Columbus lands in Guana. Trade and intercultural relations begin, lasting centuries. 1434, Henry VIII declares himself head of the newly formed Anglican Kemetic Temple separating from the Roman committed temple. 1635, beginning of, beginning of Hasidic Judaism. 1800 to 65, lifetime of Professor Harmon Wallace, Kemetic scientist. 1814 to 18, the Flash War or War of Light. Dinium City, which is like London in this alternate world, Devastated for 123 square miles and is known as the Blin. 1830 to 1910, construction of the Ark. 2000 to 2020, Hane Elal's tenure as, go as governor of the Ark. And that is the end of the timeline. So I don't know, Dave, I don't know if you wanted me to point this out, but the significant dates here, I suppose, is that. Um, is the uh, 213 AD, which is uh, where emperors start to favor religions based on committee and cosmology instead yeah. of Christianity. That's the first major. And, and obviously all these dates are about a hundred years out. They are years <laughs> before ours. So I'm saying a hundred, these things happened a hundred years before they did in our timeline. Uh, and then the other significant date, the, the hugest significant date is 1392. Christopher Columbus landed in Guana and then being like, hey, I'm just going to start to trade with you guys. I actually find out what's going on with you. And actually, I'm really into this culture and, mm -hmm. and, and, not, and not murdering and invading and, and, and conquering. He didn't do that in this, in this world. So because he didn't do that, uh, slavery doesn't happen. Because he didn't do that, colonization of Africa didn't, doesn't happen. And because he doesn't do that, African cosmology becomes the dominant religion in this parallel. So uh, ancestor uh, veneration, uh, chakras, meditation, all the things that people tend to call, you know, woo-woo, or, or like in a, in a respectful term, to use a respectful term, you know, alternative uh, spiritual beliefs, alternative practices, is completely normalized in this world. All of these things are just like, hey, everyday things that everybody does. And there's much more than that, but that's 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 the world in, in which this novel takes place. That should start at the ten, everybody. Yeah, uh, exactly. The, I have to say, the first time I read it, the the other one that stood out for me in the timeline is the Flash Wars, central London destroyed. Oh. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Hang on a minute. The whole of um, inner city London destroyed. Can I just show you very quickly, just to show what that looks like for everybody who is like what yeah. as well just that this is the map. And so the, that gray area in the middle is uh, inner city London and inner city London basically just doesn't exist. Uh, it's completely obliterated. It's called the waste or the blin, uh, which means the scar in their language. And that huge uh, big rectangle in the middle is a building called the Ark, which has been built for uh, basically people to shelter from the pollution, the resultant pollution of, you know, that comes from that area being decimated. And, but, but it's been overtaken, overrun by the rich. The rich live in the Ark and the poor live in outer city, mostly. You know, there are some rich people in outer city, but mostly they live in inner city 
and the, this is just polluted. And music there. Yeah, polluted, crime ridden. Uh, it's a hard place to live, and it's it's the whole of outer city. Not much difference from today, some people would say, <laughs> <laughs> but 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 it's much worse. It's much worse than you know in reality. Yeah, indeed. And, and well, that kind of sets me up for one of the questions I, I wanted to ask you. Uh, I, with speculative fiction or sci-fi, whichever term you want to use, and I guess we would probably go with speculative fiction for mm -hmm. a little good time. Mm -hmm. I always think of a, a quote from William Gibson. Uh, who, who similarly hates being called a sci-fi writer, uh, despite the, the, the trolley load of sci-fi awards the man's collected over years. But he's always made the point that writing in those genres is never actually about the future. It's really about the time that the writer is writing in. And you're either holding up a mirror to the world you're sitting in, or you're showing... Showing an alternative world as it could be, uh, which I, it's either him or Bruce Sterling referred to as the Gene Roddenberry effect, uh, mm -hmm. which, is, which is obviously a nod. For those of you that don't recognize the name, that's, that's the guy that, that created Star Trek. Yeah. Um, so where on that kind of holding up a mirror or here's a better way spectrum, do you, do you see what you've written here? Uh, well, first off, I mean, I, I think I have no problem being called a sci-fi writer. Not, I don't think this is a sci-fi book, but I have no problem if people said that I have, I have dabbled in sci-fi occasionally, in the same way that I dabbled in crime writing. You know, I've got no problem with that. I don't take offence uh, by it at all. But yeah, no, I think I think definitely River is uh, holding a mirror up to today's society. That's what I really wanted to do. But um, I felt like I wanted to talk about class. I really, really, really wanted to talk about class and I didn't want, and I wanted to talk about race, but, but I wanted to focus on class kind of like above race in a sense, you know, so it's, it's intertextual, you know, it's like, I think, yeah. I think, you know, the, the, of course I'm talking about race and class. I'm always talking about race and class. I mean, in all of my books, that's what I'm talking about. But this time I wanted to invert it slightly and talk about class first and then talk about race. And I always feel like when we talk about race, we feel like we have to come at it head on. You know, we have to be like, OK, well, you know, I'm going to examine racially the, how this works and, you know, then put it against that and see the where the conflict arises. And I just got like really intrigued by the question of what would happen if I took away that conflict, that conceit, if I took away race, if race doesn't exist, in, in, in a world that I'm writing about, what would happen? What would that world look like? What would be going on? You know, what, what problems would they face? And I've been likening it to um, when, when a doctor is looking for an allergy, if you're allergic to something as a person, what they will do is say, the doctor will usually say like, just take away this and take away this and take away this, okay? And at some point we're gonna start reintroducing those things one by one and that, that's the way that we'll see what ails you. When we reintroduce it, we'll see what happens. So I wanted yeah. to take race away, and then I wanted to reintroduce it again. And then, and then we can better look at race. It was a different way of kind of like dealing with race rather than being like, okay, let's just like forensically take it apart. And well, not even better. I mean, it was better for me, but, but I don't think it's better for everybody. I just felt like that hasn't really been done before. I, I can't think of a book that's done that, and that would be really interesting from that point of view to like a different way of doing it, I should say. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm also the, I guess it's kind of William Golding esque where you stand on on human beings being angels or, dev or devils. If you take yeah. away one of the problems they keep creating, what happens? Uh, yeah. the, the, the bastards create another one. Yeah. Yeah, that's why that's what I was kind of driving at with with the book, and you know, but also I feel like where I where I I stand on that is that I don't think we're either, you know. I think I think yeah, certainly individually we can be either, you know. Uh, but even that's complicated, you know. Um, I I think it's in some realm or some some kind of ideology, um, we're just being human. This is who we are. We're not. We're not angels or devils. We're just being human, and uh, being human is complex. And so, yeah, I, I, this is the other thing that kind of intrigues me. I think people, you know, sometimes some some members of society 
believe that that we're trying to say if race uh, wasn't an issue, everything would be perfect and everything would be cured. Or we're trying to say that Africa was perfect before you know, colonization. <laughs> nobody, no, no, nobody I've ever spoken to believes that Africa was perfect before colonization. Um, you know, a number of writers I've spoken to, and we've, we've, had, we've spoken about this at length, and obviously there were problems because we're human beings. We're just trying to say we're just the same as everybody else. We're human beings. And so, you know, even though you know, there's certain things that wouldn't have happened culturally. There's certain things that we wouldn't have done. We were well aware that we probably would have done other things. And there were other things that were in place before colonization, like um, class class hierarchies were huge in Africa before colonization, obviously, because we had, you know, we had kings and queens and, you know, all sorts of odd stuff was going on. Like, yeah, like, you know, concerning how kings and queens were treated and what they were allowed and, you know, I won't go into it, but there's, there's friends of mine who are, writing, who, who are writing books about that or have written books about that, you know? Uh, but, but I think, um, yeah, I, I think what we're trying to... It's difficult, you know? We're not, we're not making a case for our humanity. It's not that. We're not imploring people to people that, you know, we are human and stuff, so we're just like you in that sense. We're just saying that if we're going to write, naturally, that's what we're going we're gonna to want to tackle, right? Like, you know, 360 degrees and not not say that we're angels or devils in any way you know yeah yeah you can't be plausible by doing that no and if you're not and if you're not credible people won't read you except for escapism yeah i mean i mean, i think i think you know there is a there is a market for that i mean some people are into <laughs> are into that you know like whether you know the side of the angels or the devils i think there's always going to be a market for everything you know but um for me personally as a writer that's not really what i'm interested in you know uh and and, and i'm interested in trying to tackle new ideas i'm interested in trying to tackle things that haven't been done before um but also i'm interested in in, in writing anybody uh with nuance any character that I write, I want to, it doesn't matter what race they are or anything or, you know, what they believe or any of these things, they have to be nuanced, you know? And yeah. so this is quite, quite a, 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 a bigger way of looking at that project and saying, okay, we're not going to just take an individual person. We're going to take a whole world and try and tackle the nuances of that. I was going to ask you a question about world building, because obviously that's a, that's a large part of the writing any book like you've ever mm. time. Something that struck me very much in reading it is that you placed a lot of trust in the reader. Uh, a lot of books of this kind, you will get a great big dollar for the exposition to explain, you know, this is how this works in this world. And by and large, you, you've not done that. Uh, yeah. In a lot of ways, different aspects of, of what you're writing about. It's, it's kind of it can be 80 pages before the second shoe drops, to use the, the, the metaphor. It's like, ah, that's what those are, or that's, those are what those are doing. Mm -hmm. or That's where those have come from. Uh, how far was that a deliberate strategy? I mean, it, to me as a reader, it adds a, a great deal of intrigue. I can tell that aspects of the, the novel are important, but I don't necessarily know why immediately. Yeah, yeah. I, it was completely deliberate and it was something that caused me a lot of trouble when I was trying to write this novel because <laughs> I had a, a, a I, wouldn't say, I was going to say a couple of agents. I think I had one agent who yeah, definitely was like, why are you not building the world? Like you should, by, by this chapter, you should have built the world. Why are you not explaining the world? And I was saying, the reason I'm not explaining the world is because there's two reasons. One, it's a real trite formula that is done really well by much better writers than me. You know what I mean? I've read so many great writers who can pull that stuff off. But, but I feel like it's become a formula. You're waiting for the, when is the author going to like, yeah, explain the world, you know? The second reason I didn't do it is because I feel like they live in the world. If I'm writing from the character's point of view, this is all normal to me. Imagine if in a book you started explaining how the monarchy works, or you started explaining how to make a cup of tea, or how fish and chips are made. You know, you never, yeah. you never do yeah. these things, you know, because we live in the world. It's normal to us. And so if I was writing from this character's perspective, I felt like I wanted to treat everything as if it was 100% normal. I mean, that's the, that's the project of the novel, right? Overall, that's yes. what I'm trying to say, that this is normalised. Yeah. So I had to 
act that way myself as a writer. I had to embody that myself in what I was doing. So um, it was problematic for a while. I mean, like I, I kept getting told off by, by <laughs> one particular agent saying to me, why you haven't explained the world and you haven't done the work and you really need to do it this way and whatever. But what, and this is, yeah, I know there's a lot of writers in, in this Zoom. So, so what was really, I'll share this story. What was really wonderful is when I met Francis Bitmore at Canongate and uh, we, we had uh, Heather, um, sorry, Hannah Knowles, uh, my editor, uh, took me to breakfast and said, you've got to meet Francis because we've read the book and he's read the book and he wants to meet you. So we sat and we had breakfast. And he said, first thing he said was that, like, this is good, isn't it? And I was like, what? I was really a bit confused because I really didn't expect that. right? And then the second thing was, uh, he said, what I really love about it most is that you never explain the world. And I was like, what? Again, but that was the most vindicating thing for me because I'd spent years with many people saying to me that was one of the bad things about the book. And then it became the strength when, when Francis read it. He was like, well, you, you were very brave to do that. Yeah, well, it's, it's the expected way. Yeah. And if you don't do it the expected way, some people are going to tut or complain. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. Well, I like, sorry, I just want to say very quickly as well, I like, yeah. I like learning that way. And one of, the, one of the greatest world builders, I think, out there ever to have existed, George Lucas, I love the way that he does that. I love the way that in Star Wars, there's so many things that I don't know the answer to. To this day, I'm a grown man. I saw it as a kid. And I don't know <laughs> what he was talking about a lot of the times. You know what I mean? And, I, and he hasn't, and I don't feel like it's because he doesn't know. He's like, okay, you guys will find that out later on down the line in the Star Wars universe. And I'm quite yeah. comfortable with that. And that, that, that courage and bravery is so wait, amazing. To wait me. for the fifth sequel. All will become clear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've got so many questions about Star Wars. It's just like yeah. unbelievable. <laughs> but like, and I'm I'm quite happy not knowing. That was the other thing. I like I wasn't like, oh, I need to know how this happened and that happened. I was like, wow, George Lucas knows. That's all right. <laughs> he like he's so sure about this, that, and the other. You know, the other details were so well done that I was like, I trusted him that he yeah, he'll answer those questions, you know, at some point. He knows the answer. <laughs> That, that one day I get stuck in a lift with George Lucas. Yeah, yeah. Tell me. So many yeah. things. <laughs> <laughs> so many things, yeah. I'm praying for that. <laughs> one, one final question for me, keeping an eye on the time before I hand over yeah. to Rosemary. Uh, we were just talking about the, the unexpected. Um, this, to me, was in many ways not a book I was expecting to read by you. And I get the impression from having read other interviews with you about the book, it wasn't a book that a lot of people were expecting for, from you. And it was a long time in coming. Could, do you want to tell us a little about the, the book's genesis and that, that long, long yeah. journey to print? Yeah, yeah. It wasn't a book that, that a lot of people outside of, you know, people who knew me was expecting from me. But I think people who knew me knew this was happening for a long time because I've been going on about it for 20 years <laughs> and and also I mean I was going to say as well wait till the next one if you think that this is, is a bit wild and crazy the next one Cosmogramma is a book of short stories speculative fiction short stories it's nothing like River none of them are anything like River and there's also a novella which is a kind of a spin-off from River which, which I don't know what we're going to do with it but it's there it's this so um yeah no for, for, for a long time I said that I wanted to do this and I got an Arts Council grant in 2002 uh, to write mm -hmm. this and a graphic uh, novel um, called, it was like, it was an established writer's grant to go off and do it, something that you'd always wanted to do, but you never had found the time to do it. And it's quite a substantial amount of money. It was a lot of money. And uh, so I wrote uh, part one of River, 2002 to 2004. And I wrote this graphic novel called Messiah which was a vampire graphic novel set in Victorian Bristol. <laughs> I didn't write the whole of it. I, I, I beat it out. Like I got, it, I got the whole like, storyline for that, for that story done, the outline. And I did like nine pages of sample chapters with an artist. And then, and then I ran out of money. I couldn't, I, I, I couldn't do any more River and I couldn't do any more Messiah. And um, so I started trying to get it published. You know, I started trying to, uh, you know, uh, find publishers. First, my agency would, would, would dealing with it, but it didn't work out. They couldn't really sell it. And I ended up leaving and I had another agent, another agent, another agent. And I just kept getting knocked back. And the, the, the reason they gave for knocking it back wasn't the writing, they said, and it wasn't that, that I was doing. Sometimes it was 
why are you doing sci-fi? Like, like you know, you're an urban fiction writer. You write about council estates and kids, and you know, and stuff like that. So why are you why are you doing this? But a lot of the time, it was mostly uh, sci-fi and African cosmology does not mix. They, I mean, they said that like most of my rejections were saying that like make it quantum physics, make it about <laughs> like you know European stuff, and then it will be sci-fi. That's what they actually told me. And one guy turned me down by saying, you've got this scene where these, these this family sitting down and they eat spaghetti bolognese, bolognese. And everybody knows that black people don't eat spaghetti bolognese. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> just like, yeah, just come on. Like, <laughs> that was the most, I did all this stuff in this book. And the most incredulous thing he could find was that black people were eating spaghetti bolognese. So the enormity of like trying to deviate from the path that is chosen from you by the industry was huge. And I tried until 2006 and then I gave up. I was just like, you know what? I can't keep trying to get this book out. It's not going anywhere. And I wrote another book, which also didn't come out. And then I wrote a collection of short stories and then I got back on track and I started publishing those. So 20 year gestation period. But I had part one in the book is part one that I wrote 20 years ago. Well, and hey, black man can, can teleport. Yeah, them. yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> okay, I'll show them. I'll show them. <laughs> you have indeed. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at the clock, and lovely and fascinating as this is, I really need to hand over at this point to Rosemary, who's now going to talk to you about the screenwriting. This is a man of many talents, so we're moving on to to the next one from his his arsenal. Okay, big lovely call to you. Thank you, Dave. Rosemary. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I absolutely loved watching those films. Um, and um, I'm going to talk about, ask you about Red, White and Blue and Lovers mm. Rock. But just yeah. generally, you know, how was your process working with Steve McQueen on um, yeah. doing a screenplay? It was amazing. It was really amazing, man. I mean, I never thought I'd get the opportunity to do something like this, although I dreamt about it again since about 2000. In 2000, I went to an old cinema, a derelict cinema uh, at the back of Covent Garden, and they were showing Western Deep. And I can't remember, they were showing another one of uh, Stephen Queen's installations. And I was taken there by a friend of mine. And I never, I knew Stephen Queen's name. I knew he'd won the Turner Prize, but I'd never seen his work. And I saw those films, uh, they were films, and I was just like, God, I've got to work with this guy. I really, really want to work with this guy. So it's just bizarre that this is like, you know, it's happened in this way. Um, and he's such a, um, he's such a like, a, like a giving collaborator, you know, like he gave me space, you know, he believed in me. He was very, very tough. You know, I mean, you had to come with your A game in the writer's room. We spent six weeks in the writer's room working on just beating out the whole series together. But um, he was very complimentary to all of us, not just like singularly to me, you know, like to everybody else as well. He's just like, oh, you guys are great. You guys are great. You know, like, you know, you're so quick. You're so fast. And, you know, you, you guys are geniuses and just really yeah. treated us really well. And um, yeah, yeah, just like to me individually, just saying, you know, just remember you're special, you know, you say to me sometimes, you know, and stuff like that. And just, I, you know, after 20 years of trying to get River out and I was still trying to be a screenwriter at the same time during all that time I was writing screenplays, nothing happening. To have Steve McQueen be the one to kind of like give me a boost. You know? <laughs> he was just like, at first I was really, you know, um, I was scared, you know, I was scared in the room. I didn't know if I could back up my talk in the room. I didn't know if all the 20 years I'd spent telling people how good I was and I was ready. I didn't know if I was really ready because I'd never been tested. But so I had a, a big attack of the fear when I was in the room. But Steve and the other writers noticed and they were like, no, no, we're going to make you feel good about yourself and, you know, and get get going with your ideas. And once that happened, I got going with my ideas. It was beautiful. Mm. Yeah, it's really good. And then when, when it came to writing the scripts, uh, you know, I you know, I, I, I had a go at writing uh, Red, White and Blue, I think I started with, and then I sent it to Steve, and from that point onwards, we were collaborating on the script back and forth. And, you know, um, yeah, Steve was just like, just really, really supportive. Really like, you know, I really love this, I can film this, you know, it's just like, wow, it just, that was Fantastic. blown away. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So talking about Red, White and Blue, how hard was that to write when you're writing about a real person, Leroy Logan? Yeah. And you'd got a what a ninety minute broadcast slot, and you know yeah. is a Not really even. you know there's so much happens yeah. you yeah, know yeah. in his life, 
and uh, you know how did you sort of decide what to put in and what to leave out and so on yeah I mean it was an hour when we were doing it originally I think Steve oh, managed gosh. to wheel, wheel a bit more money but originally in the room it was meant to be one hour every film you know so so it wasn't a lot of time uh we, we like I said we beat it out in the room and and we had you know there was a, a few of us writers in the room who were working out every story that we were going to tell for every film and uh we did it together it was a collaborative effort you know Steve was in the room you know I remember I think he was away for like four days but for those six weeks uh, the rest of the time he was there with us and we were all working it out together and he was very much directing the project and we had a uh, lead writer Rebecca Lenkowitz who just you know like just amazing screenwriter you know uh, so many credits to her name playwright as well plays on at the national stuff and she, she was the lead writer and she was you know, really honing things and you know with, with us and um yeah we just we just kind of really really went for it creatively and and um it was it was it was difficult with with Leroy I think you know just um trying to pick the right moments but we've managed to very quickly find a window of okay this is the time in his life we're not going to be talking about the the very very early stuff we're not going to be talking about the stuff that came after this moment but we're just going to talk about this specific period of time I like biopics that do that I'm much more into biopics that try and do that rather than the birth to death biopic I'm not really interested in that because I find it yeah. tries to cram too much in into 90 minutes and then working with Leroy was just um I didn't know it at the time I was very very daunted I remember when Steve came up to me, everyone was getting their episodes, you know, everyone's getting their films, the writers in the room and stuff. And I was still wandering around a man without a film, you know, and I was a bit, I was a bit worried at that point. I was like, every day I went in there, I thought I was getting the sack every day. And then, you know, it was another day had gone by and it was the end of the day and we had a little party, you know, we were meeting some people and, and you know, I was just like, what is going on? Am I going to get an episode or not? And then Steve came up to me with his arm around me. He's like, I want you to do Leroy Logan. And I don't know if he saw the fear on my face. <laughs> that was famously the most difficult film out of the lot. And, it, and, and it's, you know, to tell his story, how do you justify and get an audience to empathize with a man who joins the police force after the things that happened to his dad. You know, I mean, how do you square yeah. that up? Yeah. So that was what scared me. But Leroy was just so um, giving and warm and welcoming. And he really wanted to tell his story and he really trusted us. And he trusted Steve, obviously, most of all. He didn't know me from Adam. But over that two years or so, it took to write the script, I was phoning him. I was DMing him on Twitter. I was like having hour long conversations where I recorded him. And I understood for the first time I've done this, you know, worked with a real life character, what benefit it was to have the guy there who could tell me this happened and this happened and this happened. And then his wife as well, Gretel, I did like a session with her, Lee John. I did like, you know, at least a couple of hours with Lee John. But that was good because they they contradicted a lot of what Leroy said or they came with a different angle or they had a different opinion of him and perspective. But he allowed that as well. So um, it was great. It was such a, like, your research is a living, breathing person, you know, who didn't get involved with the process, didn't try and tell me what to write, you know, just gave it, gave me all the facts and then left it alone. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. He, he, he is such a fascinating um, character. Yeah. He, he said, I mean, he's working after his retirement, he's still working tirelessly, isn't he? To, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, he is. He is. Um, and he said recently, we've regressed 20 years um, yeah. since his time in the force. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and he's, you know, uh, black people are nine times more likely to be searched than white people, was um, something that I read from uh, reading about Leroy. Well, uh, search yeah. if you're lucky, you know. You know so, uh, I'm saying sorry. search if you're lucky, you know. There's just this news about this ex-footballer, you know, who got you know tasers and kicked in the head and, oh, God, uh, and yeah. died. You know, they, the guy, the policeman, just got a manslaughter charge for that. So you know, I mean, it's that. It's so scary when you get pulled over by the police. You know, Absolutely. Because you don't know what's going to happen. You know, people don't understand that. I think a lot. No. Know? At the end, you know, that there's a quote. Sometimes I think the earth needs to be scorched, replanted, so that something good will come of it. Mm -hmm. So how you know how do you, how do you feel about how we can move forward? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really, to be honest with you, I think it's a really apt metaphor. Yeah. For 
what's going on with the police right now, and I, I say this globally, right? Not just, and I don't think it just even pertains just to black people either. I think you know, look at that poor woman. What happened to her with that police officer? You know, the poor woman in South London in Clapham. You know, uh, look at what they were doing to the women on that protest. You know, we've been saying for a long time. If you let this happen to us, it will happen to you. You know what I mean? It will have, they, will, they will take bigger and bigger liberties and stuff. And, you know, it's like Leroy says in Small Acts as well, the police are the public and the public are the police. You know what I mean? And I think we do need to get back to that, that kind of idea, you know. That, that it's, not, it's in everything in a way. You know, someone was telling me, we talk about doctors, you know, like earlier today with a filmmaker, and he was saying, remember when the doctor used to really, really... And there's some great GPs out there. Don't get me wrong. I've had I've got the luxury and the benefit of really brilliant GPs. But he said when when the, the doctor tried to get to know you as a person yeah. and they really really cared about you and they really there was this one to one kind of um, you know interaction with you. And I think we've just lost that in many aspects of our society. This yeah. closeness, you know, this interconnectedness of people and society. And so I do think. We need to start again. And I don't know what, if that, you know, I don't know if that means defunding the police. I don't know if that means retraining the police. I don't know if, I don't know what that form that will take. But I do know we shouldn't carry on like this. Mm. Because when, when women are getting dragged off the street by, by a policeman and, you know, terrible things happening to them, when a man's getting kicked in his head in the street and tasered for nothing, you know, that's too far, surely. Right? That's like, oh, yeah. when is that going to stop, you know? Mm. So, so I think I think it's a very uh, dramatic, powerful metaphor, right? You know, for the end of a movie, and it serves that purpose for for the film, uh, for the drama. But but it, it doesn't necessarily mean burn everything down. You know what I mean? In that sense, it's a metaphor. You know, it means um, you know, let's start again. Let's change things. You know, let that scorched earth. Let's just uh, um, you know replant it. You know, uh, I think that's that. Mm. Moving on to Lovers Rock, um, uh, because I'm looking at the time, it's got an entirely different feel to it. Um, the shots are wide shots, a lot of wide shots in red, white and blue, showing sort of Leroy, you know, being out on a limb and so on. But Lovers Rock is joyous, the shots are close and intimate. Um, Lovers Rock, um, it's just absolutely beautiful, it's, it's sensuous and empowering. Mm. I loved all the hands entwining and the dancing and um, storyboarding must have been really fun. I, I had no no um, involvement in any type of storyboarding, but oh. I will say this. I was looking for it because I thought you sent me the questions beforehand and I was trying to look through the call sheets for Lover's Rock. Well, it's a, a wonder to behold because someone had a lot of fun <laughs> writing up the scenes, you know what I mean? Like They were like... <laughs> And they, they, they were really, it was almost like every scene that they'd written up was like a little pun, you know, like on what was in the scene and on a pun on Lover's Rock. And some of them were so funny. I was like, who wrote this call sheet up? Someone oh, was yeah. having a really good time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, and um, yeah. the use of music and, and, and well, in both films, but it's silly games in Lover's Rock, you know, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's 10 minutes or more. Yeah. And then they sing after the music has stopped. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's really holding your nerve, isn't it? You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> even even for myself, um, Steve is very uh, bashful. I think about that moment because when we were in the writers' room, he played silly games. When we talked about this film, when it was called Saturday Night, he he played he played silly games. You know, he knew he wanted to use that song from day one, and. Uh, when when we were talking about the script, there was a point where Steve said to me, uh, um, put the whole song in the script. Yeah, we're going to stay with that moment a bit. You know what I mean? And I was like, really? He said, yeah, just put the whole, just take the, find the lyrics from somewhere and put them in. They'll be, be, be the, in the script. And so, yeah, I, we, I did that. But also then I started to do the interaction because I was like, you can't just have the script. You have the DJ saying things and stuff going on around it and, you know, making it fit the moment and, and making it fit what's going on on the dance floor. And so we did that. But what I think has happened, I think he's right. He's not, it's not this untrue that, that, that what happened in the room just happened. I think once you had that as a kind of scaffolding and stuff, then something else happened. And yeah. 
Coral Messam, I'm messing them. I think it's Messam. Coral Messam, sorry for butchering your name, Coral, if you ever see this, but Coral was the choreographer. And she told me, she said, I was rehearsing with these guys who had never heard this music before, didn't really know anything about it, but then they realized this is what my mum was doing back in the day. This is what my my like, this is what my grandparents and my uncles and aunties were doing. And they caught what we, we called it, caught caught the spirit. You know, they got into it so much and they had a transcendental spiritual experience reconnected with their past in that way and that's what Steve caught and that's when it there's this one scene in in Lovers Rock I always it always really gets me is when there's that uh, young woman who's by herself and she's just dancing and she's just got this big smile on her face you know and um yeah I, I, I could really see it they were just they they were living it as it really happened yeah I mean I I felt as if I was in the room with them. Yeah, yeah, it was I mean, real for them. Yeah, it's just, yeah. And the attention to detail, you know, like the light bulb, the DJ with the light bulb over his shoulder and so on. <laughs> but how did you, you, know, you talked about the choreographer, how did you, you know, work as a team with a designer and, you know? Yeah, and yeah. there was loads of research gone on done you know and Dennis Bavell I don't know if you saw him he's the, the older man with the blue suit on Dennis Bavell was the producer of Lovers Rock so he was in the room you know uh they, yeah he was there he was he played the old boy who came from upstairs you know what I mean that's the guy who produced Lovers Rock so he was there in the in the shot uh there, there was there was um photos when you went to the you know, the, the production um you know, the, you know where, where they were producing the film you know when they went you know it was it was like these big boards up. We had different um, pictures of sound systems and they talked to people and there was a guy who was a consultant, Michael McMillan, and he was talking to them about, you know, like how the wallpaper would look and how the room would look. He did an exhibition called the West Indian Front Room. So they consulted Michael. But um, one interesting thing about that is that Amara, uh, Amara J, St. Aubin, who's the actress, you know, who, who, who plays the lead, uh, she came into the room, I think it was for her first read-through and she sat down on the table. She tells this story. She sat down on the table. She looked around at all the pictures of all the sound men and men and stuff that they got from different archives. And she looked at one and she said, that's my dad. <laughs> and, then she put it and, she like, and there was her dad. Who was, her dad, it turns out, was Asher Senator, who was one of the biggest sound system men for a sound called Saxon. Uh, Smiley Culture was in that sound. Um, um, Maxi Priest, you know what I mean? A guy called Tipper Irie. They were all from Saxon Sound. And Asher Senator is a legend in the community. And that's Amara's dad. You know what I mean? It was just like, it was so close. So many people. The guy who, the, 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 one of the MCs who was DJing on it, he's like, his dad was a sound man, you know? It's like, it was so close to those kids, but um, a generation removed, you know? Or maybe two. Yeah, just just uh, just an amazing atmosphere. Yeah. So yeah. I'm just looking at the time, and I mm -hmm. know we've got to, uh, to leave time for questions. So that sure. sort of leaves 10 minutes, so I hope. Great, that. great. Yeah, yeah sorry but I thank you. That was wonderful. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Have a look and see if there's any. I need to unmute myself. A lady called Sarah has asked a question. Yeah. Sarah, if you'd like to unmute yourself, mm, you can ask yeah. your question yourself. Yeah. It's much better to talk to each other, I think. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, mind. okay. I'm really sorry. I'll have to go without the video, unfortunately. That's all right. um, okay. Yeah, I was just curious. Um, so basically, I'm writing a dissertation on urban fantasy. Now, I know that it's not exactly fantasy, but I'm really curious mm -hmm. about the urban elements in um, a river. So yeah. I was wondering if you could say a bit more about why you chose the urban setting rather than the rural setting, and maybe also um, why London in particular, because obviously it's a lot about Africa and everything. So I'm really curious why. Um, it was mm. London that you chose above all other cities. Yeah, so uh, yeah, it's a really good question. So uh, why the urban setting? Because I've always, I, I, you know, people were saying stick to being an urban writer when I was trying to push this book out. And I was like, but I am. Because uh, what I really wanted to do was just broaden the parameters of what we consider urban fiction, you know, and to, to also for the people who, who were the real life uh, inspirations 
uh, for, for books like The Scholar and Society Within. I wanted them to have a chance to see themselves in an entirely different context, you know? I wanted them to see themselves in fiction and in, in science fiction and live in science fiction. Like you hardly ever see, you know, just ordinary council estate kids in science fiction unless it's Attack the Block or something like that or Misfits, you know, which I think is great, you know? But I wanted to show, uh, like I wanted to have a different depiction. I wanted to have a depiction that was my own. And, you know, the reason why London is because I'm a Londoner and uh, I wanted to see that myself. If I had been growing up and reading books and I discovered something like this book myself, I would have freaked. I would have been like, this is it. This is what I wanted. I'd imagined it for so long. And uh, I wanted to read a book like that. You know, Tony Morrison says that, you know, you know, write the book that you want to read. And so I, that's what I was doing. I was, I was like, okay, I would have loved that book. I'm going to do it. And also, um, I am very much, I feel... You know, you know, I'll write about anything, you know, I don't really mind, but my area of expertise is Black British culture. I've, been, I've, I've like, I think about you know, my second book in, I was like, okay, this is what I want to be. This is what I want to write about. This is what I want to push the boundaries of. And um, so for me, yeah, that's what I know best, right? I know London. Uh, I'm really into Black British culture. Uh, again, it hasn't really been done. I've never seen, I've seen lots of books that were talking about America, lots of books that talk about speculative fiction in the Caribbean, lots from Africa. I'd seen very little from Britain. And so uh, I wanted to like make a contribution, so to speak. And what I'm really interested in, just to end, and I know I give long answers, but sorry, but it's such a complicated question and it deserves a proper answer. What I'm really interested in is uh, who's gonna come after? Who's going to read this book and be inspired to be like, OK, I'm going to do my version and who's going to do it in their completely unique and interesting way? I want to read that. I want to be able to read the book that I haven't written. You know? I'm really excited about that. <coughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Another question from, from me, thinking about what you've been saying uh, and how you got pushback for writing a, a black urban sci-fi novel. Um, as somebody that's written across so many genres, are there other genres where you, you think we're desperately short of seeing black writers being published or black voices being heard? Yeah, I mean, loads, practically. I mean, I, wouldn't say, I was going to say practically everything, and that's like going a bit too far. But I think, yeah, just it's so it's such a constrained... Uh, feel to be in you know people have all sorts of ideas of what it is and I'm like how can you have ideas of what it is it's only existed for the last I don't know 50 years or so if that if you want to count it as that so it shouldn't it should be the, exactly the opposite right it should just, just blossom and go out and we should test the parameters of what it could be and what works and I have a I have an inkling that anything will work we're finally starting to see that now, writers are uh, being allowed to take the risk, which I think a lot of writers of the past would have wished that they could take, you know, but they couldn't. And so, um, yeah, I, I think I think it's only a matter of time. But there's, there's still more things that I want to do. There's still more genres that I want to go into. And when I started, I knew that I wanted to be a genreless writer. I knew that I didn't really want to get stuck in, oh, I'm going to just tell these types of stories. Um, so, so my mum, she thinks she she when she said when she saw the scholar, she was really shocked, and she thought I was going to do sci-fi ages ago because <laughs> she knows me well. So she was like, "I know that's your favorite thing." So, yeah. So um, yeah, we shouldn't be constrained by what the industry is telling us to do. And unfortunately, you know, there's lots of implications to that: financial, you know, notoriety, all of those things. But the more risk we take, I suppose, the the, the higher we'll be able to climb. Do you think those kind of, I, I want to say stereotypes, that that black people don't write sci-fi. It's, it's, we were joking earlier, black men don't, don't teleport. Is that just coming from the industry or is it also coming from within the culture? We, we don't do this. Therefore... No. No? Yeah, 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 no, no, it's not in the culture at all. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, not especially not the science fiction thing. There's so many science fiction geeks, the, the black science fiction geeks all around the world. And yeah, yeah, we don't, we notice, we, we write our own stories. We've always had science fiction. That's why, like, going back to 
Hemet, you know what I mean, and Egypt and stuff, and you know, like yeah. you know, Mali and all of these places that have a deep connection with our, our space. Yeah, you know, it's just been, and even growing up, you know, like like uh, you know, I was really into uh, George Clinton, I was really into Samra, I was really into Grace Jones, I was really into you know all these black Afrofuturists. You know, there was Octavia Butler, you know, way back when, you know, uh, Samuel Delaney. Uh, you know, uh, I, you know, obviously I was freaks when I saw Lando Calrissian in Star Wars, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> so there was, there was, you know, it's always, it's always been there. Like for me, dub music, being born into a, the culture of dub music, where I'm listening to these sounds and stuff, and it felt like sci-fi to me. It felt like black sci-fi. To me, black sci-fi has always existed, but it's always been denied. And, and, and that's what, it's, not, it's definitely not coming from the culture, man. We're, we're inherently uh, sci-fi oriented. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm asking the question. I'm, I'm conscious John has a question, so I'll, I'll be sure. As a, as a gay man, I'm conscious that there's a huge LGBT fanship for, for sci-fi and fantasy mm -hmm. writing as well, mm -hmm. because it is somewhere that writers can create alternative worlds. Yeah, and there's a. I wouldn't say with gay sci-fi writing, it's mainstream, but there's an established kind of sub-genre yeah. then. Uh, yeah, yeah. But, and maybe there's something about sci-fi that, that's like, we'll let you loosen the parameters a little here. You might not sell so mm. many copies, but we're not going to stop you. Uh, mm. Well, you know, Sam Delaney, Samuel Delaney, I always call him Sam like I know him, I shouldn't. It's really <laughs> Samuel Delaney was hugely successful you know, as a queer sci-fi writer, queer black mm. sci-fi writer, you know? And so, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's really funny. Like, yeah, and there is, and, you know, there's the old rule adage with that, you know, we'll, we'll let one in, in you know, <laughs> like, and so, yeah, it, we, won't be, we won't make it a movement. Let's not make it a movement. <laughs> but, but um, you know, uh, River Solomon right now, I did have the privilege of doing an event with them uh, just recently, and, you know, they're changing things up. In, in an amazing way and you know this is there's more and more and more out there you know it's just so encouraging to me to see that and you know i just think you know it just there, there shouldn't be anything we shouldn't say that anyone can't do anything really in that sense you know i mean as long as it's not derogatory mm -hmm. to people and whatever and obviously that's questionable but you know like those kind of things like you know black people don't or queer people don't or trans people don't or non-binary people don't you know really, that kind of thing is just like no, like I, I like I personally don't ever want to hear that, and because it, it kind of stunts the curiosity in human nature, which yeah. is so broad and interesting and stuff. You know, why wouldn't I want to yeah. learn about people? Isn't that what we're yeah, here don't, for? No, don't choose <laughs> to put the straight jacket on. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. John, you, you yes, I'm, I'm conscious, Kosha, that you're a a man of many genres, um, with with successful outings in several different directions, and you gave the example. Uh, when you were speaking earlier, where you kept your instincts rather than explain the whole of the world in River. And I was yeah. wondering whether, given that you've had success, both in different forms of writing and the, the visual side of film, um, whether you find that you're consciously leaking between genres and if you're putting together something which is a written form, there's part of you saying, well, this might really work in a, in a film or, or, or televisual context. And I yeah. think there are some of your things that are uh, in, in in progress in yeah. in television. So, does it do you leak across genres? Does it matter? Is it a good thing? Yeah, it does. First off, I don't think it matters. Uh, yeah, whether I do or don't. Secondly, we I'm weirdly compartmentalized about that kind of stuff. So, so usually for me, a book is a book. Film is a film. TV is TV. But then I will do variations on a certain theme. So at the minute, I'm developing. A short story into a TV show. Uh, so one of my own short stories into a TV show, but um, it's nothing like the short story. I, 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 you know, as a, as a, there's a real power in adaptation, you know. So, so like the, the short story Memento. You know, if you read the short story Memento, you see the film. They're nothing alike, and I believe that type of adaptation is really interested. <coughs> Sorry, if I can't do that type of adaptation. I kind of tend to leave it alone. So there's other short stories in the uh, collection that I've got that I'm giving to other people. I'm just saying, you know, you another writer take that and you do what you want with that as a TV series or as a screenplay, because I can't, I only see it as that. 
And if I can't like um, push the boundaries of how that concept is, is looked at, if I'm just going to do the same thing again, then I'm not interested. I have to evolve that, that concept in a way. Um, I'm trying to think of another example. I mean, River, I think um, I'd like to collaborate on someone with an adaptation of that. I wouldn't do it by myself. I can't see it. I've spent too long with it. I don't want to take it apart. I just put it together. I don't want to break it up and take <laughs> it apart again right now. Just, yeah. that'll just do my head in. Um, but with, with Link, that, that's that particular short story from Cosmogrammer. I think a couple of months afterwards, I was like, oh yeah, but Link could just carry on. From the end point of that story, it could just evolve into another story about another character in that same world. And that was interesting. So I don't know if that's what you mean by leaking. Is yeah, that... I think so. I mean, what, what you're also implying is that we shouldn't hang around waiting for a river called Time Six. Um, you know... Yeah, yeah, that probably won't happen. But, but <laughs> I might one day write um, another story set in the world because the world's so vast and there's so much I didn't use from this. Yeah, there's so much that isn't in the book, even though the world is really big. So I, I wrote a, a play uh, called Look to the Sky. And Look to the Sky... It came out way before this book came out, but it's it's a it's a version of this. It's basically it's these young kids encountering one of the sleeper pods that's in the book and what that does to them. And I do want to do. I'm going to say it here. I haven't seen it to anyone uh, recorded, but I, I have got a tiny seed of a story in my mind of a YA version of River that will be like the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, but but set in like Labrador Grove or in Forest Gate or something like that, where there's this old house. Well, actually, it's more like the the, um, the first uh, story in the series, in the Narnia series. I can't remember the name, The Magician's Nephew. So uh, where there's this old house and they find a sleeper pod in the house and what that does to them. So, or, or a sleeper room even, you know, but uh, I've got an idea for other stories in the world but I wouldn't do a sequel. But Marcus, Marcus is done, I think. You'll never see him again, I think. <laughs> <laughs> never say never, though. You know, you know like if I had an idea, then I'd be like, no, no, actually, I'll go back on that. <laughs> you, you just very nicely cued uh, another question from Guy. Hey. Mm -hmm. Guy, if you want to... Ah, yeah, I was as that is yeah, I was I just put that in the chat just before you started talking right. about sleep because it was one of the things in the book that I thought was really um really strange and made me made me think about how weird sleep really is, you know? Right. And I've never quite got that before. Um people mm -hmm. go to pod in the book, don't they, rather than yeah. bed. And they kind of yeah. generate energy in this way. I don't want to yeah. don't want to give too much away, but you know, um yeah. and I haven't really got a question, but I'd like to, I just wanted what your thoughts about sleep and, and the weirdness of it. Yeah. Wow. That's such a big, great question. Thank you. That would have been a question, Dave, like that I had been asked that, that, that yeah, <laughs> I, I wish I'd thought of. Yeah. Sleep, obviously <laughs> sleep. Oh man. There's that saying, um, 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 uh, something about sleep being, uh, was it a slow death? Or, you know, or, or the same sleep is a cousin of death and things like that. And like just uh, uh, or that little death, you know. Um, I, yeah, I, I'm fascinated by sleep. I really am. And I, I'm glad that that came across from the book because I feel like, you know, when you do your checklist and you say, oh, things that I did really well and things that I did less well. Like, I wasn't sure that I got into sleep the way that I do in my head, like the, the, the way that I really, you know, I didn't explore it enough I felt like in, in the book but yeah sleep is like it, it's such a big thematic component of the book but it's a background component um I, I don't have any kind of um I don't know you know when it comes to sleep I don't know I don't have any like big fascinating like insights about sleep at all I just feel like, like I have I don't have any answers where it's concerned obviously um I have some thoughts but I think I'm probably wrong um, one of my favorite films is The Science of Sleep, uh, the Michelle Gondry film. And, and my wife's always laughing at me. She's like, you love that film? I watched it like you know, eight or nine times. I'll just watch it again and again and again. And I always get something new out of it. And just, um, I don't know, just like, like, like the idea that you can play around with it and what does it mean and, and, and what, how can we use it? And you know, what animals sleep and what animals don't sleep? And, you know, just like, what is it? Yeah, what's its function for us is just huge for me. But um, 
yeah, I don't really, I don't have anything definitive to say about it. I just think it's a massive playground for us, and obviously for a writer, you know. It, it, it doesn't really answer that your question. I'm sorry about that, but yeah, just uh, yeah, I, it, it really, it was really important to me in this book that, that I, I, I played with it in a sense, you know. So like, you know, de, deja vu in the book. A deja vu in the book for me is is a uh, is a way of the body recognizing the past lives or the alternate alternate lives that we live. It's a, it's, a, it's it's like flashes of your alternate lives, you know, the, the person you could have been. And I think I think sleep is a for me a way of connecting us with um, our spiritual beginnings, the place where our soul comes from. I think that's that's what I really believe. Yeah. Hi. Right, thanks. I'm, I'm going to throw in one last question, I, I'm keeping an eye on the time too. Uh, and various people are, are, are going to wander off for their dinner. Mm -hmm. But I, I wanted to, to, to quote back at you. There was one line towards the end of the book that really stopped me dead in my tracks and went, well, that sums up 50 years very thoroughly, uh, which is, the, the, I guess, going back to the holding up a mirror aspect of sci-fi writing. Uh, it's, but it's the, the final sentence of a paragraph. Um, in the early days of the Ark, neural communications were part of the Cometian Temple and formed one faction until the temple moved to a separate building two streets away. Religion and scientific knowledge, technology struggled to make peace ever since. But that, that struck me as that's one of the great human themes of, of our century, that mm -hmm. we have scientific progress and we have faith which in a lot of ways is playing out rather less positively than perhaps it is in, in mm -hmm. a river. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I was alluding to the fact that in river, as far as they were concerned, that, that there'd been a divergence between those two things as well, but obviously to a lesser degree than we probably have it in our, in, in our timeline. Yeah, yeah, that was something. And now that's another one of those things that to a greater degree, um, than sleep, that I felt like I wanted to say so much more about that in the book and I was trying to get like you know you know when you're trying to force characters to say things and like you're just like I'm not going to force them it has to come <laughs> them naturally but I wanted I wanted uh, Nesta to talk about that in in, in the second uh, parallel you know I wanted him to have a big conversation with Marcus about the the the, the divergence of technology and spirituality you know as, as far as he saw it it just didn't seem to fit it felt like it would be exposition and so I left it out but uh, so I could only get in that. That's the only bit that I could really <laughs> talk about it. But um, yeah, yeah, I think it's it's massive, and I think it is is a it's you know it's a problem, isn't it? As well, you know, if you have religion and, and science too closely linked, then all kinds of problems can come out of that. You know, one way or another, you know, uh, can be used as a way to control the masses either way. But I think what we've got now is just quite. Um, yeah, it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And there's so many things that in, in, in particularly African spiritual practice that uh, has now been proven through quantum physics and is the same in quantum physics, you know, like, you know, like just all sorts of different things, like the, the ability of particles, you know, like, uh, uh, like atomic particles or microatomic particles that exist in two places at once, you know, like people have been talking about this in African spirituality for like, like years and years or even like, you know, Hinduism and stuff and Buddhism have been talking about this kind of thing for years, but now they're saying, oh yeah, we have, we've observed or not observed, that it, that it, it does actually exist, you know? Finally, the physicists have caught up. <laughs> well, that's the way that I look at it, you know? Well, finally, they, 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 they've found a way to make it make sense to them. They've believed, in a sense. And, you know, I remember seeing a, a physicist talk one time, he said, it's all just belief for us. You know, it's all theory and belief. Like, there's so many things we can't prove, which is, that sounds like religion to me. So, like, yeah. Oh, yeah. There, there's so many crossovers, you know? If, yeah. if you want an evening of, of mysticism and spirituality and abstract belief, take a bunch of theoretical physicists down the pub. Definitely. Uh, right, mine is, exactly. Exactly. You get your, you get your is, money's is, worth. My husband is a physicist. Yeah. 
and I often go down the yeah, pub really. and have yeah. conversations with him. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. I mean, like, the stories they tell, man. But even things like, you know, back in the day, I, I've got this in a line of one of my stories or, you know, like the uh, Rastafarians used to talk about, you know, Af and Felakuti used to talk about Africans being the first people on earth. And people used to laugh at them. They say, oh, they, they smoke so much wacky wacky. You know, really like, oh, you know, how can you say that? You've got no proof. And then DNA proved it. Character was like, <laughs> they said it for years. Um, like, like, and I know, like, you know, like sometimes religion manages to handle these truths that science only comes at like way, way later. And if there was a conversation, we we'll lead up the process in some way. That's what I'm interested in. Or would it hinder it? I don't know. Yeah, probably a bit of both. We, we need to get the physicists on the case, I think. Uh, I was going <laughs> to... Just to round things up, I would, first of all, thank you. You have been absolutely fascinating and as delightful as thank you Thank you. Thank Bless you. Would you like to tell us what to expect from you next? What's in the pipeline? Yeah. What's in the pipeline? Uh, well, Cosmogramma is coming out in October. And uh, where River was the real me trying to kind of like break the confines and boundaries of tra traditional sci-fi, I was trying to do any anything to kind of not be that. Um, Cosmogramma is the opposite. So Cosmogramma is really drawing on sci-fi tradition and you know some of the some of the uh, masters and mistresses of science fiction, which is it's quite broad for me. So you know you've got Octavia Butler, you know, but you've also got oh my name's gone from my head. But uh, Daphne du Maurier, you know, I feel like, you know, the birds and some of those things are like, you know, that's like kind of speculative fiction, right? So uh, I'm really a great fan. Uh, Shirley Jackson, you know, obviously, you know, yeah. people like that. So so um, I'm taking those guys, but also like um, John, John, not to say John Grisham. Um, oh, God. Uh, well, you know, I hate when your brain goes blank. Uh, Day of the Trippets. <laughs> uh, I know, of course, I know this guy's name. John yeah, 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 guy who wrote Day of the Trippets. Robert Sheckley. John Wyndham, yes, exactly. John Wyndham, Robert Sheckley, you know, those guys, I'm just trying to like, kind of take things that they've done and, and give it a new spin. So that's, that's uh, as well as doing my own stuff as well. So that's coming out in um, October, I think. And just more films, more TV. I'm working on a couple of things now, but nothing's like green lit at the moment. So I'm not talking, talking about it, but um, I'm developing lots of film and TV at the minute. Fantastic. Could you? Thank you. It's been an absolute joy. Thank you so Thank much. You. Un Thank unmute you. everybody and give the man yeah, a, a yeah. round of applause. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. That was really enlightening. Oh, no, thanks so much. And I hope you guys have a great evening. And I hope I didn't like take you away from your dinner too much. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. It's been worth uh, it. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Have a great evening. Yeah. Thank you. Good night. Thank